Julie Wagner. I'm sorry. Uh, the president of the Branford Land Trust. We're a nonprofit organization, 55 years old, all volunteer run, and we protect about uh, 1,600 acres in Branford, uh, most of which is open to the public because we maintain over 30 miles of trails, bridges, and boardwalks in Branford. And we are super excited about this topic tonight because on many of our properties, we are trying really hard to keep the native flora and um, battle, do some battle with the uh, invasive flora. So I'm super excited for this presentation tonight. I'm going to start by reading first our land acknowledgement. The Branford Land Trust acknowledges the people who have called the lands we conserve home. We honor the Totoket and Monunkatuck bands of the Quinnipiac people who were dispossessed of these lands. We pay respect to those who are no longer here, and we celebrate the continuing and future presence of indigenous people in this region. We're grateful for their stewardship of land, water, plants, and animals over thousands of years. We also recognize other people, past, present, and future, with connections to this land, those who were enslaved and brought here against their will, those who come for a better life, and still others who flee danger and seek refuge. We vow to protect the land in perpetuity, to foster access to nature for all people, and to help heal our human relationship with the earth. So part of healing our human relationship with the earth is trying to maintain and, and restore our, our native flora. Um, and we are so lucky to be partnering with the Conservation Environment Commission um, Heather Sweeney, who chairs that, we at Brantford are so lucky to have Heather leading the Conservation Commission. And in fact, last night, um, she went up to Winstead because Brantford won the Bronze Award for Connecticut Sustainability. And uh, she's really leading the town's efforts in conservation. So we are uh, very grateful to be partnering with the Conservation Environment Commission on this presentation tonight. Um, so with that said, uh, Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce your speaker. Heather, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you, Julie. Thanks for letting me know. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, thank you for your kind words, Julie. As she said, I'm the chair of Brantford's Conservation and Environment Commission. We are a commission of the town of Brantford, and we are run by, we are all volunteers, all of us who are commissioners. And we are delighted to be partnering with Julie Wagner from the Land Trust. We're, we are really lucky in Brantford that we have such a strong land trust. Once the land is developed, it's it's out of the ecosystem in a lot of ways, not always, but a lot of ways. So I'm really grateful for the land trust's work. Um, and I'm also excited and grateful for the library partnering with us. And so thank you to Jenna Anthony for all of her help. Um, I am really excited that Dina is here to speak with us tonight. She's been a full-time farmer since 2005. She was the director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Connecticut from 2019 to 2022. I saw her speak um, virtually at an online conference, conference last fall entitled The Need for Seeds. And I was super excited and wanted to get involved. And that's part of what led to this partnership tonight. I'm delighted that she'll be um, sharing her insights and experiences, um, talking a little bit maybe about the ecotype project that she initiated and founded and her um, endeavors as a seed entrepreneur. Thank you so much, Dina. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to the Blackstone Library as well. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was really struck, you know, I think part of what is meaningful for me about tonight, just by, by way of introduction, um, is that it is so heartening to me to think that land trusts and conservation commissions and 
uh, like-minded groups, but are, are, are reaching across land use <laughs> uh, to extend their portfolio and to extend um, uh, time to farmers to sit down at the table, to seed keepers, to sit down at the table with conservation folks. I think that is a really important gesture and one that I want to just sort of take a moment and acknowledge and be grateful for at the beginning of this. I recognize that I am not speaking to the future farmers of America tonight. <laughs> I am, and uh, that's a really wonderful opportunity for, to, for me. So thank you for that. Um, next slide, please. Who uh, I think it's Julie who's ran, running the slides tonight so she can advance that slide if possible. Julie, can you? Yep, um, I know. Okay, cool. Yes. <laughs> not doing it for some reason um let me see if i start my video we we did all of this it is not advancing oh there, there it is, is. there it is oh, so sorry just a okay. delay no worries okay. um thank you the um where place I wanted to start is just also to sort of extend that land acknowledgement, which was so beautifully articulated um, by Julie into a sort of moment of reverence, for lack of a better word, for seed. Um, seed, we have moved away culturally from a place in which we understand how sacred seed is, how smart <laughs> seed is. Um, that it is the completion of a life cycle. It is the start of a life cycle. Um, it is this incredibly powerful and tiny thing that many of us um, have sort of stepped away from, particularly in the farming and gardening world. Um, we have lost so much of our um, sentience and our knowledge as seed keepers. And so this journey that I have been on for the last couple of years um, is, though I've been farming for, you know, almost 20 years, uh, I have been a seed keeper just very in the last four or five years. Um, and so this is uh, exciting for me also just to be able to sort of share this passion I have and, and it's relatively new knowledge. I feel like no matter what, I'm always a beginning farmer, no matter how many times I try to be expert, I find myself back at the beginning. So um, the other thing to say about seed and Julie, you can advance the slide is that it is in addition to being sacred, in addition to being smart, we know it as nourishing. Um, most of our food, be it grain, spices, nuts, beans, all of those things that we are taking in to find protein and energy to run our lives, the poppy seeds on our bagel, they are seeds and they feed us. Um, and so that last piece of how nourishing seed is, is where I also sort of began my journey with all of this. Uh, next slide. Sometimes we even forget, you know, that our wheat, that our oatmeal, all of that is seed. Uh, next slide, Julie, if you get a moment, there she is. Um, and my interest in this work and my first real foray into understanding the importance of seed and seed keeping was through spending time with this woman, Vandana Shiva. Some of you may have seen her work or know of her work. Um, she lives in the foothills of the Himalaya, um, but she is known all over the world as a activist, seed keeper, farmer. And her Vandana Shiva's life work has been to champion the cultural, the historical, the social, and the economic imperative that we have to keep seed free and cycling in our communities. Um, one of the indigenous seed keepers uh, who I really admire, Rowan White, um, who is a member of the Mohawk tribe, she, I heard her once say, 150 years ago, seed companies didn't exist. And if we do our work right, <laughs> in 150 years, <laughs> they won't exist. <laughs> that is, we as farmers and gardeners and conservation folks interested in restoring plants and native plants to our community and plants to our garden will learn under the tutelage of these brilliant indigenous seed keepers um, like Rowan and Vandana, um, how to take back that knowledge as part of our craft. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, so setting that as a quick backdrop, I came to this work because I'm a farmer. And you may ask sort of, you know, why is a tomato farmer from Ridgefield coming to speak to the Branford Land <laughs> Trust? And that really for me is rooted in a study that began to sort of rise to um, popular understanding about five years ago. And it was a longitudinal study that had started in 1976. And that happens to be the year I was born. And so it was one of those sort of in your lifetime studies that, that gave me pause. And what it documented was a 72% decline in insect abundance. So most of you who are involved in the pollinator pathway and all of this work, this isn't news to you. But for me as a farmer, it stopped me in my tracks because I recognize um, as this, you know, kind of shocking t-shirt says, <laughs> um, when those pollinators go, when they go, we go. And so if you look at this um, photo of my blueberry crop, for example, many of us don't think about the connection between seed and pollination, but the other sort of galvanizing moment that got me into seed, and we will get to native plants, I promise, is that we had a um, entomologist come to my farm. I'm aware that seeds are an important part of, of our food system. And I was aware of the pollination issue, but he came to my farm and he said, and I said, you know, it's, he said, it's very hard to talk to farmers about the lack of pollination services because we see a crop. And I said, absolutely. Like, I don't have a problem because look at all the tomatoes and look at all the fruit. And what he did is he took one of the blueberries from my field that had become ripe. He cut it open. He looked inside and he counted the seeds. And then he went to the blueberry or the tomato house and he cut open one of the tomatoes and he counted the seeds. And he reminded me, though, I did go to seventh grade biology. I had forgotten that when the bee visits the flower, that she makes that connection between the pollen and the flower. And the mother plant detects the presence of a seed and puts a little fruit around it to help it grow. And then another bee visits and you get another seed. And she puts another little bit of fruit around that seed to help it grow. And it is not, pollination is not a light switch. <laughs> it's not a, your food has been, your crop has been pollinated or not. It is about that same word abundance, a 72% decline in insect abundance, therefore translates to a decline in those pollination, many, many, many pollination gestures that help our fruit grow and help it be juicy and wonderful. And when you're someone who gets paid by the pound, juiciness <laughs> matters to me. <laughs> um, and so this study on insect abundance stopped me in my tracks and took my career in a completely different direction. And one I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about tonight. Um, next slide. Uh, the need for pollinators is rooted in this Anthropocene, and I don't need to sort of dwell too long in this other than to say we know that what the pollinators indicate and what they, their decline indicates is that possibility of cascading collapse in our ecosystem, that the lack of native plants begets the lack of pollinators, the lack of pollinators begets the lack of fruit and food and the cycle goes on and on and the collapse can go on and on. Those tipping points are real and they are to be feared. <laughs> and the federal government realized that. And so in 2015, this lack of native plants was ultimately um, part of what created the national seed strategy. And so this is where the good news begins. The federal government said, we recognize that we need native seed in order to get native plants that that work starts with the production of seed. And so this seed strategy was written by the Bureau of Land Management and it helps us and it sort of became a national call um, for people to step up and develop a seed supply chain. Next slide. Um, the, where this begins to come back to Branford um, is this, somewhat hard to read, but fascinating slide. Um, when I look on the Bureau of Land Management's 
website and I look at the land that they are maintaining in this country, this is the federal government's um, job to sort of protect and steward acreage across this country. Um, Alaska, the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, is in charge of 70 million acres. California, 15 million. Nevada, 48 million. It's something like 50% of the state is managed or something by the BLM. But if you look at this little line, and I keep going back to the website because I think this must be wrong, but in fact, it's not, that in the 31 states east of the Mississippi, the BLM manages a grand total of 40,000 acres. Like that squared doesn't even get you to what they're managing in Utah, right? And that's 31 states. And so if we think that the federal government's national seed strategy is going to apply and translate both in dollars and in humans and in capital and effort and all of that to our region, we need to think again. Next slide. Um, and so when I realized that the federal government wasn't going to help out, I started saying, well, if not them, then who? And that leads me to my to your door, <laughs> which is that the land trusts in this country, the conservation commissions, you begin to add up that acreage. Land trusts alone have conserved 61 million acres of private land across this country. In Connecticut, over 200,000 acres of land. That's five times what the BLM holds east of the Mississippi. In Connecticut alone, that land is held by land trusts. There are 123 of you. You guys probably know all of this. Add up the Conservation Commission open space, and we are talking about a really big state-run um, amount of stewardship of the native plants of this region. And so as we think about restoring plants to this region, and we think about who can do the work, we have to find um, a shared framework. And that's where our next slide, Julie, will help. Um, James Omernick, and I hope some of you have seen these maps before, but just like that study of the 72% loss of insect abundance, this one blew my mind as well. I think I was almost like in tears when I first saw this map. Many of us as gardeners remember the old like zone six, zone seven, what zone are you in to tell you whether the plant were still by. Climate change has sort of done away with most of that, sadly. And so James Omernick, who was a military soil scientist, I believe, um, was struck in doing restor ecological restoration work that when you talk to the bird people, they all come in with their maps. And then you talk to the water people and they come in with a different set of maps. And then the soil people come in with another set of maps. And then the tree people and the flora and the fauna. And everybody is, needs, says Omernick, a shared framework, a shared map in which we can layer the geology, the soil, the vegetation, and understand how to do our work, how to create and foster biodiversity, how to do ecological restoration with plants, um, all together in one room, all together on one map. And so that is where you get this eco-regional map, and you can kind of locate yourself in Brantford. And you can see that though on some level this is... Um, a mosaic. It's not meant to be a hard and fast, you know, delineation. Um, it does sort of make sense. If you go up into Litchfield County, into the sort of Berkshire Hills, you can feel that the woods change. And I don't know why, what that imperceptible difference is, but we recognize that things are a little different up there. Um, and so that's really what this map is sort of helping us into it, what we may know intuitively, it helps us see. Um, so then if we go on to the next slide, this eco-regional map then helps us define this new word, um, which we're going to use from here on out in this lecture, which is an ecotype. They are the plants that have measurable adaptations to the location in which they have co-evolved. They are the wild type. They are the straight native. They are the ones that are truly from this place geographically specific, genetically appropriate plants from Branford. <laughs> um, and they are for Branford. And that um, word, an ecotype, is what we are now using to sort of describe in our conversation tonight, the next step in the conversation about planting native plants. Many of us who have joined the pollinator pathway, and I certainly as a farmer, when I realized I wanted to 
um, start planting native plants for pollinators, um, not all native plants are the same. And we can go on to the next slide. I went to the native plant working group at the Connecticut Department of Agriculture and I said, Turns out we need ecotypes, right? We can't just plant any old native plant. Echinacea is not from here. It's a prairie plant. It's, its genetics are completely you know, inappropriate in many ways for this region. Um, it can be a good host. I mean, it can be a good nectar source, but it's not necessarily a host plant for the insects that we're looking to, to help. Um, and so I asked them, who is creating ecotypes? Where can I get some? If that's what I'm supposed to be doing to do our work in the best way possible, we are supposed to be planting these ecotypes. Where do I get them? And wonderful Dr. Stoner at the Connecticut Ag Experiments in Sason said, nowhere, no one's making them. We haven't done that work yet. 98% of the milkweed that you can buy in Connecticut if you want to help the monarchs, Dina, on your farm, all of that milkweed, the genetics are from Tennessee and beyond. And so though you want to do the right work and do these restoration projects, um, many, many times you cannot find the plant material that would be best for that work. Um, that Tennessee milkweed, the reason it matters that that milkweed is not from here is that when those poor monarchs are on migration and they're flying down, doing the best they can to stay alive, my goodness, those things are endangered now, um, they hit Connecticut and they may see Tennessee. The bloom time is different on that milkweed. The nectar quality is different. Um, and that's confusing. And those plants have a harder time persisting in our restoration projects um, because they are not our plants. They are not our milkweed. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, this sort of very busy cycle picture or poster that we made, <laughs> you can follow along with it, um, describes what we at the Ecotype Project and as a group of farmers um, set out to do. When I talked to Dr. Stoner at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station, and she told me that there are no ecotypes. I said, well, if you have a production problem in this conservation space, if you need plants, then you need farmers. And so we need to rally the farming community to come together and join many of us for the first time, the conservation communities around us um, and find like common mission <laughs> with folks doing conservation work because y'all need plants and we know how to produce them. I don't know half the Latin names of the plants I am growing right now on my farm, but I know how to produce a lot of plants very quickly. And that's what I've spent the last five years doing. Um, so if you look at the top of this cycle for the Eco Ecotype Project, um, in order to put ecotypic plants, and we're not really gonna, I'll try now to sort of from here on out tonight, use that word ecotypic rather than native because we're describing a very specific kind of native plant. If you need to get them back into production, you need to find the wild seed first, those true Connecticut or eco region 59 where we are located, those true eco 59 natives. And that means you need botanists, and people with, you know, generally advanced degrees, and they come out with little hand lenses that are various samples and all these fancy um, terms, and they go into the wild. We've been working with Jordi Elkins at the Highstead Arboretum, this sort of extraordinary botanist who has been championing finding and collecting that first initial population of wild seed. And that has to be sustainably collected. Um, and it has to be uh, accessioned in the right way and all sorts of interesting things happen around that, the protection of that natural resource. Um, and then it goes to farmers who grow out the seed as a crop. We then bring in uh, harvesters to harvest the seed from the initial tiny population and harvest sometimes from the 200 seeds that the botanists give us, the farmers um, can harvest millions of seed. That seed is cleaned and prepped for sale either back to the public or into the nursery industry. 
and then hopefully um, back out onto the landscape to begin to sort of rewild or rebuild or restore uh, the landscape in the Northeast. So we're gonna break this down a little bit more slowly. I know it's sort of a complicated poster here, but we'll go through the steps quickly. Um, describe my work, next slide, Julie. Um, so there's Jordy, wonderful Jordy. Um, he is a seed collector and he is out there basically getting those wild populations. The important thing to note here, of course, is, and I think one of the sort of most important things of tonight is that this call for ecotypic seed and, and wild plants back in our landscape is not a call to say, everybody go out into the woods and start collecting seed. Um, we, I don't wanna sort of let the horse out of the barn here. Um, you need permission, you need training. Many times you need a PhD to get out there and determine what is truly wild seed, what is truly ecotypic seed. Um, and it sounds like um, Heather has already lined you up with a wonderful botanist who's visiting in a couple of weeks um, to walk you through this process. So that'll be exciting. Um, I think it's the, is it the 21st or 28th? What did you guys decide, Heather? The 28th. Thank you. Wait, perfect. Dan Brubacker is going to come and visit and, and take you on one of these field walks. Um, it's really an extraordinary uh, process, and I hope many of you can join. Um, but the point is to begin, as we did in the food community so many years ago, to start saying, hey, where's this from? I want to know that my seed is collected locally. I want to know that my native plants and my ecotypic plants are grown out locally. Um, and so Jordy makes sure that that happens. He collects the seeds sustainably. Uh, next slide. The uh, over the years, uh, we are now, we started with, I think, four collections. Jordy brought us four little envelopes with seed um, and grew out some plants um, from four different species of ecotypic plant. And we are now up to almost 50 in production, um, 50 different species across the region. Spring, most of them are wildflowers, almost entirely we're in wildflowers and grasses right now. We haven't yet started to work hard on shrubs um, and woody plants yet. Um, but we have many of these wildflowers, some of which are spring bloomers, some of which are summer bloomers, some of which are fall bloomers in production on our farms. Uh, next slide. Jordy gives us the seed and then we grow out that initial tiny little sacred offering from the from nature into these plug trays. And you can see farmers now stepping in here um, to grow out uh, different species. And we start with 200 as a minimum sample. Um, and those 200 wild plants, that first generation, um, is given out to farmers across the region. And we're in Connecticut, we're in Massachusetts, all over Eco Region 59. Um, those plants are then planted. Next slide out on our farms. Um, so here is just a quick picture on the right of my farm, the hickories here in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And those are two rows of seed crop. It's uh, you're looking at New York ironweed and Joe pie weed, um, both of which are great, beautiful pollinator crops. Jordy has been very kind in, in um, providing us a lot of really beautiful plants, which makes, uh, I think, the adoption of this whole movement a little easier because he's giving us these uh, super models to work with. Um, and, you know, when I, I have to say as a farmer, when I started growing uh, ecotypic plants for seed crops, um, I work with a team of other farmers who looked at me like I was nuts. They said, do you know what we do? We, you are planting iron weed, Joe pie weed, milk weed, sneeze weed. These things are going to blow into our crop and they're going to be a, such a nuisance. And we've spent so much of our time trying to get weeds out of our fields. The idea that I was planting them and trying to grow them was really a hard sell for my team. And Yet over the first year, when I put these rows in and put these plants in, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you that the magnetism that these wild plants have because of who visits is just like gobsmacking <laughs> that by once these things bloomed, 
you know, they became, it was like JFK out there. There are, you know, hummingbirds and millions of different kinds of butterflies I've never seen before. The pollinators came, the birds came, and it became instantly on our farm, the place that everybody gathered to have the five o'clock beer. It became the place that everybody wanted to sort of, you know, snoop around in and, and take photos because they were just so, um, they're so compelling what was happening out there on the seed farm. And it wasn't very long, of course, because we as farmers know that our paychecks are signed by the pollinators, that they suddenly said, well, why don't we put a few more of these and why don't we put them out by the greenhouse so that we can get these pollinators out closer to our crops rather than rather than far away. Um, and so that was uh, that was really sort of a, a, where it began to take off. And I began to sort of um, realize that maybe we had a tiger by the tail and more farmers started to join in and they all wanted the pollination services. Um, and I knew that the community of conservation folks out there really need these genetics. They really need these plants. Next slide, please. And so more and more farmers have joined on with this network. It's called Eco59 as our new burgeoning seed company. We have uh, urban growers at Urbanscape's Native Plant Nursery. They're growing our whitewood aster. Um, we have young farmers at uh, Ivory Silo and Hungry Reaper. We have experienced farmers, um, some of whom are up in, you know, all, all over the region. And it's been really exciting to just sort of go out. It feels a little bit like I'm, you know, the new Johnny Appleseed out there trying to get these new, <laughs> new plants into our, into our farms and into production for seed crops. Um, so given that many of you are probably not going to join as seed uh, farmers, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do and how this might translate to the work of the Branford Land Trust and the Conservation Commission. Next slide. When we grow out the crop, and you can see I'm using ironweed here as an example, um, we've had to learn a lot about how to collect seed, how to produce it, and how to ultimately get it back into the landscape. Seed, like any other crop, has to be harvested at peak ripeness. So you will probably note if there's any ironweed on your walks um, now and in your open spaces that it blooms in this beautiful purple. It begins to set seed. And then when it gets that sort of crazy, woolly, frizzlehead look that it's about to blow away, that is sort of the moment of peak seed ripeness. That's when we, um, as seed keepers, step in. Next slide. There is, here's another species and that and that New York ironweed is, is such a challenge because it does really like it, it blows away and it's like one flock of starlings and I've lost the whole harvest. So um, we have to keep pretty close tabs on when exactly to harvest, but this is Penstemon digitalis or foxglove beard tongue. And it um, comes into a, in a very hard pod and the seed is um, kept, we almost have to hammer it out to get it out of these pods. Um, but you can see, and for many of us as farmers, when we started growing this, and I will say for you who are gardeners who get excited about becoming seed keepers, um, it's not like you can just buy these plants and turn the packet over and do what it says on the back. No one has necessarily grown these in this region before. So there aren't instructions and we've had to really make the road by walking, so to speak. Um, when the seed crop comes ripe, we're looking at it with our hand lenses thinking, is this the seed? Is that the seed? And what's the chaff? Where's the seed? And sometimes the seed is as small as dust in a lobelia. Um, and sometimes it's a big, you know, um, milkweed seed. Uh, next slide. Once that seed is harvested and we've picked it off the crop, you can see there is Sephra, who is one of my partners at the Ecotype Project. Um, she is uh, collecting seed, and that's the New York ironweed that's getting sort of gently sh um, shook into a paper bag. Um, once it is harvested um, and we harvest all the seed, and I'll explain why in a little bit, um, that then needs to go out and get cleaned and get tested. Next slide. Um, and that seed, um, before it can really go out back into the world, um, needs to be storable, and that means cleaning it. Um, hopefully, Dan will also walk you through that next or two weeks from now as well, um, and you can learn a little bit about that. You're always welcome to come to my farm in Ridgefield and learn about seed cleaning um, and the Ecotype Project. We offer farm tours all the time. 
Um, but ultimately, uh, it leads to, next slide, Julie, um, it leads to, for me in my first year, this is a photo of these, you know, baby food jars of seed that I made. And I was so proud that I had managed to get these things through to harvest. Um, and then I had a conversation with someone in Nevada who called me up and she said, oh, we've heard about what these farmers in Connecticut are doing. And we'd like to copy this program out in Nevada. We recognize in Nevada that when we are doing ecological restoration, we really need the plants from Nevada because if we get plants that are grown out in Washington state and other places, um, and we use them in our restoration plots, in a couple of years, that seed, those genetics wake up and realize that that Washington sagebrush or whatever it is, is in Nevada and it's hot and it's dry and they can't make it. And so she said, our restoration projects have no real persistence because we're not using our own ecotypes. So we want to do some of this work too. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Tell me about some of your projects. And she said, well, we have 350,000 acres burning and counting. <laughs> and so we need seed in order to feed those animals. And they're seeding with helicopters over mountain ranges. Remember that initial slide of the BLM, right? They have so much land. And I turn around to my baby food jars of seed behind me and think, oh man, we're going to need a lot more farmers and we're going to need a lot more land um, to produce the amount of seed that might be necessary here. Um, and so we have over the years um, thought really hard, and I've been thinking a lot about how to do this work in the Northeast. Um, Next slide, please. Um, we ultimately have a small seed company, Eco59. Um, I invite you all to visit and, and see what these farmers have produced. Um, we sell packets of seed, ounces of seed, um, all of which is ecotypic to Eco Region 59, hence the name of the company. Um, but more than that, um, I have begun to recognize that we're never going to get helicopters, you know, packed with seed on this, on this small effort. And so Back to that slide, of so much land is being shepherded in our region um, by land trusts, by people like you folks who say, you know, we have a small restoration project here. And of course, you know, you can always come to the seed company, but wouldn't it be wonderful if seed keeping was not held in the hands of just Jordy and Justina, but if it became a sort of community-based effort um, and something that every conservation commission, every land trust felt was part of its job. Um, because you have, many of us are presiding over those very special populations of ecotypic plants in our open space. Um, it may in fact behoove us to protect those plants and protect that genetics um, by collecting the seed and making sure that the seed that we shepherd on our open spaces in our conservation commission lands is used to restore our own plots. Um, and so my hope is um, as we move through this and we can uh, jump to the next slide um, that you all will join um, in what our farmers are doing and gather seed in the fall with folks like Dan. Um, and instead of necess and so I've been thinking a lot about how to take this from a farm scale and move it into a gardener scale, move it into a um a land trust scale, a conservation commission scale, maybe Mrs. O'Leary's first grade class scale, um, because that's what we have so much of in the Northeast is this sort of community-based effort. And so this is the time of year and it's so perfect that we're gathering tonight to talk because this is exactly the time where this work can start. The mother plants are out there in the, in the world and they're about to cast their seed out into the world, most of which will go to feed birds and mice and, you know, blow off into wherever. Um, but if we can gather some of that seed um, right now, this is when that seed gets planted. Unlike what our farmer brains tell us, which is you plant your seeds in the spring, um, ecotypic plants or native plants, you plant the seed in the fall. And it needs winter in order to wake up. And so if you look at this little simple guide, it's five quick steps. You 
take the seed, you spread them in a pot or on one of these trays. This picture on the right is our little seed starting kit that we give people. Fill the tray with soil, put the seeds, sprinkle them ever so lightly on top, just as if the wind were to have cast them onto that soil. You're not going to bury them the way you do your peas. You just let that plant sort of wind off that seed into the soil. And then you leave them outside and without that stratification, without winter to trigger those little seeds to wake up, they won't wake up. If you take them in and baby them and put them in your greenhouses or put them on your windowsills, they will never experience winter and no signal will be sent to that little seed that winter has passed, spring is here, wake up. Um, and so these little seed starting kits are a really great way, um, but you can do it obviously on your own with a pot. And the only thing we have learned, and I, you know, am, my middle name is to learn everything the hard way, but if you do not protect these seeds <laughs> um, from birds and mice, um, the birds and mice are hardwired to find them. That is their food source. So let them eat the seed that you leave behind, but the seed that you take, protect, protect, protect with screen. If that screen shifts even the littlest bit, they will find a way in and they will eat all of your seed. <laughs> and it's so much effort um, that you really do want to make sure it's, it's protected and safe. Um, and then in the spring, that seed will grow out. Um, it will start to emerge in your pot or in your little tray. Um, and you can begin to transplant that next summer into either your garden or any restoration projects you have. Um, and you can see how this can be done at a big eco-regional eco scale and how it can be done in your backyard with a couple of pots um, and maybe you know someone's first grade class or the land trust, et cetera. Um, you can jump to the next slide. The, uh, ultimate goal is that these plants get back into the landscape that once you grow once that we as farmers grow out this seed crop that you put these right plants these ecotypic plants back in the right place that you get them back out here to do the work to host that monarch or black swallowtail or beneficial who knows what um, as it comes through Connecticut and um, so that's really the work that the farmers have done and in the last couple of minutes before we open up for questions, I just wanted to talk, um, if you go to the next slide, about um, kind of what you all can do and some of the projects that are just starting and we're in the very edge of this happening with certain land trusts that um, they, and I am gonna sort of quote Edwina Van Gaal. Some of you may know her work with Two Thirds for the Birds and a bunch of other um, really extraordinary projects. Um, she asks us in her lectures to, in our minds, picture a beautiful place, some piece of open space, some walk you take um, on Conservation Commission land, some part of the Branford Land Trust. I went out to see that beautiful new farm in your holdings, um, some part of your land, some place you love, and picture that in your mind. And then she says, copy that, <laughs> meaning those plants have co-evolved in that little beautiful place that you find bees, um, they have co-evolved together. They like to be together. They've lived together. No one planted them, you know, and watered them and fertilized them. They've just figured it out. And that's their guild. That's their community. So collect seed from that particular plot, from that acre, from that little area that you love. Collect the seed and grow it out and copy that. We're, take, we're starting with Randall's Preserve. If you go to the next slide, um, we're gonna go through that same poster, but we're now gonna talk about what we're doing with a tiny little preserve in uh, uh, Easton, Connecticut. The Jordy is out there just like Dan will be, wild collecting ecotypic seed from a preserve that they love. The Aspetic Land Trust this is. They love the Randall Preserve. And so we're gonna take a couple of collections from the land Randall Preserve. And then as you see this winter stratification box in the next little photo here um, under number two, that's just a four by eight box made of wood and screen. I'd be happy to make one for the Branford Land Trust <laughs> tomorrow. Um, it's a four by eight box. It's cheap as dirt to make. Um, and in that, they are able to protect with screen on the bottom and screen on the top um, all of those wild collections and grow them out or stratify them, meaning wake them up over the winter. In the spring, 
those trays will start to grow. And my goodness, do they ever. Um, they grow in the spring. Some of them will germinate over the summer and some of them, some of that seed is so dormant, it germinates in the fall. Um, and those plants as they emerge are pricked out as we say as farmers or they can be up potted or, or transplanted into larger pots to grow out over the summer and then be either um, you know, used, you can go to the next slide. Um, they can be used uh, in, Aspartac is using them for plant sales or for restoration projects, but they are their own plants from their own preserve. And so Randall's is about to give birth to like a little mini Randall's somewhere <laughs> out there in the world, a little mini me, um, whether it's in a school garden or in an urban rewilding project or in a larger scale restoration. Um, down to, and this is, I encourage you to look if you're a home gardener, um, Aspatec Land Trust is using some of those plants and on their website, they have small, small down to like the mailbox four by four native plant garden using ecotypes. Um, they have all of these designs on their website. Um, if you go under aspateclandtrust.org forward slash garden dash kits, um, they have a million different examples um, of gardens that you can build um, from collections or from with using the ecotypic plants of this region. Uh, next slide. And so um, I will send this resource list to you. Um, and if you go to the very last slide, there it is. Um, it is my hope that you know, as we begin to sort of cast a wider net among the seed keeping community, that what my experience has been in the last five years, becoming a seed farmer and learning to work with ecotypic plant material, um, it can translate to creating for you all um, the best possible chance that your restoration projects have to succeed. And the best possible chance they have to succeed is if you begin to collect um, Branford plants for Branford restoration, um, seaside goldenrod for your seaside. Um, and that is really, I think for me, been um, what I am looking forward to in the next couple of years. We've had all of this work growing out seed crops and I do love doing that and will continue to. Um, and I, I would love to have you all come visit the farm at some point and see what we're doing. Um, but more than that, I would like to make sure that I can share um, some of this sort of beautiful work out um, and see you all becoming seed keepers as well. Um, on this last slide is my email. Um, I've also, my... Um, partner in all of this is Sephra and I always share her email. She gives me permission to do this because I'm a farmer and I am not great at answering email. I often say, if you email me before May 15th, I'll get right back to you. If you email me after May 15th, I'll get back to you at Thanksgiving. <laughs> so um, Sephra's email is there as well. The seed huntress is her moniker, um, the seed huntress at Gmail. And you can, she's very good at answering email. So I always make sure that I pair mine with hers. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have time now in the few minutes remaining to answer some questions that may have propped up. I see that um, some of you guys know Stone Acres, so that's awesome. You do have a blue wood aster and a, and a pycnanthemum, a mint growing out there. Um, they've been, yeah, you guys, the Stone Acres have been great, great partners in this. All right, we're back to the whole group. Great. So um, let's just, Heather, what do you think? Open it up for questions if people want to unmute themselves or raise your hand or raise your electronic hand. And we'll defer to Jenna for oh, okay. instructions good. on good, how good. to do it. But yes, Julie, thank you. Time for questions. Yeah, I'd say if you're comfortable unmuting or raising your hand, go for it. If not, just type in the chat. I see David. Yep. I have a question in regard to the possibility of, uh, or the of some kind of uh, um, Region Fifty Nine uh, vegetables, vegetable seeds. That's a that's a great question. Um, there are a couple of folks in the vegetable world um, because those plants are. Um, so subject to human selection. Um, there are some folks working really hard on what we call in the vegetable world land race varieties or varieties that are sort of um, 
hefted to particular regions. Um, I would point you towards uh, Bill Braun's work with the Freed Seed Federation. Um, he is working with farmers to do on-farm seed breeding of vegetable plants. Um, the critical difference, and this is something that I really um, at times struggled with, is because when I came to this work, I came to it as a farmer and farmed seed or most of our vegetable seed, remember, has been stewarded by humans to be as predictable as possible. Meaning my whole career, I've been working with tomato seeds, you know, and you turn the packet over, you plant them, they all germinate on roughly the same day, that seed breaks and germinates on roughly the same day. And you can basically harvest it on the same week or two. Mm -hmm. And it's tuned because we select for that seed. We as humans say, if you don't behave, tomato plant, we're not going to save your seed. And so we select for plants that are predictable. In the wild seed world, of course, what I've had to unlearn as a farmer is that mother nature is selecting for the opposite. She is selecting these ecotypes are purposefully unpredictable. So I'll give you that Penstemon example, the foxglove I showed you. Um, the first year I grew that, I looked at the tray in you know, June 1st, I pricked out the first 75 seedlings and I threw the tray aside because I figured 75 had germinated and grew out those 75 seeds into, or 75 plants. And then I happened to be walking by that tray four months later, you know, learn everything the hard way, Brewster. And I happened to be walking by that tray that I had cast off and another 75 plants had come up at some point in the summer. And I thought, what gives? So I transplanted those out. And then I was curious. So I left the tray and a year later, another 75 seeds germinated. And I use that as an example to say, if all 200 seeds or 225 seeds had germinated on June 1st, when I expected them to germinate, and we had had a drought or there had been a huge rainstorm or something else, that mother plant wouldn't have gotten her babies through. And so she puts some of them into a regular sleep and they wake up on time. And that nature is so much smarter than we are that she puts some of them into a deep sleep and they don't wake up until September. And she puts some of those plants in those little babies into a coma. So they don't wake up for a full year because God forbid they wake up in a drought year or whatever. Nature has tuned towards being unpredictable. And so in many ways, um, what we know as seed farmers and seed savers in the vegetable world, I find myself having to unlearn as I do this in the conservation world. And I hope that can sort of go for a long way of answering your question. I know there are other hands up. <laughs> Thank you. I see that Julia Muris has her hand up. Hi, yes, I do. So thank you, Dina, for your talk. I found that riveting. Um, I'm a biology teacher, but right now I'm actually working part-time at Stone Acres Farm. So I'm the one that threw that comment out. Um, and I've been walking by that wood aster every day, kind of waiting for it to um, to be ready. So it's been, it's been really fun. Um, but so my question is just, uh, it's just, I'm I'm really deeply curious about this work and where we could take it for our region. So um, in terms of capacity building, where are you at organizationally? Like, do you do volunteer days? Are you looking for volunteers? How do you get more involved? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. From your, from your lips to God's ears, as they say. <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah. So we have um, at our farm anyway, and I'm sure at Stone Acres, um, and other places, um, there are farmers who are definitely interested in volunteers and trying to get people out to do um, seed work. Um, at the Hickories, we have both seed tours, we have volunteers who come in. I have this amazing group of folks who come in Mondays to work on the seed farm. Um, then we have people who come in in the winter and wanna learn about seed cleaning. So I invite you to come to all of that. Um, on a larger scale, though, the work that we started with the ecotype, so, you know, get in touch with me, get in touch with Sephra um, to, to key into that. But on a, a bigger answer to your question, um, the work that was sort of 
sparked with the Ecotype Project and Eco59 um, has largely now been um, adopted and is championed by the Native Plant Trust out of uh, Massachusetts. Many of you may be familiar with their work. They're kind of like the big research leader in this space. Um, and they, oh, sorry, that's my local library. Okay, I'm back. Um, the uh, the Native Plant Trust is championing the Northeast uh, Seed Network. And so they are trying to begin, bring together on a much larger regional level throughout the entire Northeast. Um, and I would say key into what they are doing and that Northeast Seed Network as well to sort of follow because they're going to do a lot of trainings for collectors and all kinds of stuff. Um, they're a real leader in this space. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dina, a couple of questions from the chat. One is whether anyone is starting work with Woody's. Not yet. Um, I think that is kind of the next big hurdle. Um, we started with um, inland forbs, like those Joe Pye weeds, and a lot of those are um, semi wetland plants. And as Jordy sort of, this is sort of a sad thing to admit, but Jordy said, if you're looking for ecotypic plants, we have to start with the wetland species because everything that's high and dry in Connecticut has a house sitting. It. So there's no more native plants. Um, it's just the wet areas that they can sort of find them, but that's changed over the years. Um, the next hurdle for us is going to be um, coastal restoration species. Um, so we just planted our first uh, Eco Region 84 seed farm out on Block Island in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're doing island restoration or coastal restoration species there, kind of the dune plants. Um, and then I think the next will be hopefully um, the woodies. There are folks, Daryl Newman at Planters Choice Nursery um, is, I hope, going to be a leader in that as well. Um, the nursery growers will do um a powerful job i bet in in doing that lift for us more than the more than the seed farmers Thank um, you. that's a great question it's really essential someone asks if seeds could be stratified in a freezer that's a good question i meant to say that so if you um don't collect seeds in the fall or you don't get to plant them, um, you can stratify them not in a freezer but in the refrigerator so if you want to put them into like deep storage you know, long-term storage, I think you can do that in a freezer. But if you want to stratify them to trigger them to wake up, um, you can also kind of simulate winter for your seeds by putting them into in between two wet paper towels. Heather McCargo at the Wild Seed Project, I can point you to her as someone who um, does a lot of fridge stratification. Um, you put them in between two kind of wet coffee filters or in a Ziploc bag, something to keep them moist and cold. I generally, when I am going to fridge stratify something, I put it in the back, I throw the Ziploc bag in the back of my fridge. And then inevitably it's about two months later that I go around to cleaning out my fridge and I go, oh, right, those are the seeds I threw in there. And after about two months, um, those plants, most most native species, um, 60 days is usually enough. Some of them take 90, but many of them, 60 days is enough that they will break dormancy and you can then seed them out in a tray. So <clears throat> you can do that in April if you need, stratify them April, May, and June, and then plant them out um, in a pot in June and they should, they should uh, start to grow. In general, I have found, I will say as my farmer anecdote, um, these seeds do better with actual stratification outside in the rain and snow and sleet in that little screen box, then I have had more success and higher levels of germination doing it outside than I have in my fridge. That's my anecdotal comment. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question about climate change, specifically are natives being monitored for their ability to adapt and if the seeds that you're growing up fail to thrive, what are the next steps? That's a great one. Um, the, and yeah, I should probably have a slide on that. So there are two different ways to save seed. One is what we call sort of ex situ, like the seed banking. So those are the guys who take a sample of seed and like, you know, Bill Gates, like put it in the Svalbard seed bank and the permafrost and keep it there forever. And that seed is, is frozen in time. And as the climate changes, I think you're absolutely right in pointing out that those seeds may not 
necessarily have what it takes to survive. What we are talking about tonight is what we call in situ seed banking or the living seed bank. And so if you think of those uh, Joe pie weeds that were in that slide growing on my farm, um, they were two years ago when I harvested the seed, I called up Jordy and I said, look, you know, we had a drought two summers ago, like I have never seen before. And I don't know if any of this seed is going to be viable. And if I get it back from the seed lab and it says that 10% is viable, should I even sell it? Like I thought, who's going to buy seed with a 10% germination rate? But what Jordy said is, of course, and it makes sense once I think about it, he said, that's the most essential seed to sell because that 10% has figured out how to survive a never before seen drought in Connecticut. So these seeds are sort of in constant conversation with the climate as it changes. Um, and I think that's sort of, for me, what gives me that perennial hope that the micro adaptations that plants are making live time um, will give them the best chance to persist in this region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone asks if you're thinking of permaculture in your work. What a great, yeah, a great group of questions. Um, you guys are a very enlightened group of folks. Um, yes, I do. I think about it all the time. And my um, some of my training is in permaculture. Um, and I've been able to put very little of it into practice, frankly, on my 45 acre vegetable operation. Um, but I think that is part of the sort of you know, triple threat or triple win of these plants is that they both create, you know, bio, they foster biodiversity. They create perennial systems on our farms, which means deeper roots and, um, and soil that is, you know, protected in perennial systems. Um, and many of them are creating, you know, uh, a sort of stabilized, uh, I don't know if I can say like a sort of an incubator on our farm. Um, and I think those are many of those things about sort of perennializing agriculture um, are part of the tenets of permaculture. Um, and so it's been exciting for me to be able to bring in and for many farmers to be able to bring in, for example, in between two greenhouses where there may be, um, you know, you may find an area that's prone to erosion to stabilize that with perennial plants and native plants that have many different roots um, is really important. Um, we're thinking about uh, permaculture a lot as we think about the design of these farms as well. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a really lovely, lovely layer to put onto this. Sorry, is tall evening primrose an ecotype? Janet has a forest of it and wants to decide if she should just <laughs> it or not. That's a great idea. Um, you know, I would say when it comes to what's an ecotype and what isn't, I have sort of held the line that that is a little above my pay grade. <laughs> and you need to talk to the Dan Brubackers and the Jordies about that because, you know, not determining whether something is an ecotype is first determining whether or not it is truly native to this region and people define that as you know pre and post glaciation and all other interesting things that they use but as you look at the species and the population itself um, you have to determine whether or not that population um what, what the land use history is. So if it's growing in your backyard, did someone plant it there? You know, was it, did it actually blow in? Is it truly wild? Has it just naturalized from somebody else's cultivar? Um, and again, um, I'm a tomato farmer talking to you. So I leave that to, to the Dan's and Jordy's. Um, but when they, you know, if they determine that it's ecotypic, I'll grow it out for you all day long. It's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely a volunteer and it's beautiful. And there've been hummingbirds and wonderful everything. All there, summer is a native, there is a native program. So I, know I, I think I'm just going to disperse it no matter what, because it's so beautiful. <laughs> From what I've seen of Primrose, it may do a good job of doing that itself too. Yes, yes, it has. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. If there are any other questions in the chat that I didn't read, um, perhaps raise your hand or speak out. I think I got them all, but I don't want to miss somebody by mistake. And I wonder if there's anyone um, else who wants to add a few more questions before we wrap up.
Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I really have enjoyed uh, being able to talk to you tonight. It was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Dina, thanks so much for um, just a fantastic, energetic presentation, and I look forward to uh, future conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have a wonderful night. Good thanks, luck with Dina. your work. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Cheers.